for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the Saturday evening service of July the 8th, 1995. Fourth of July family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dr. Bill Nell of Salina, Kansas is the speaker of the evening. Last uh, Monday night, I think it was, we, uh, we covered a number of facets. We covered a number of things. And one of the things that we said was that we are called that in this world you will serve a spiritual authority. If you will look in uh, Acts 26, Acts 26, uh, we'll look at, uh, start with verse 15. This is Paul's witness to King Agrippa. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, so rise, stand to your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I have yet to reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Hebrew people and from the heathen to whom I now send you. This is his commission, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, here Paul says that his authority is to move you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the Satan's power to his power. We covered that there had been a rebellion in heaven, that Satan had rebelled against God, that Satan was originally Lucifer, the light bearer, an anointed cherub. In Ezekiel 28, it's listed, he was... He had anointed, he had rebelled against God, and he was cast out of heaven. He was cast out into the mid heavens. In the mid heavens is where he stays. Ephesians 6 says that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, authorities in heavenly places in the heavens. It's hard for some people to conceive that Satan is still in the heavens. But you remember that Paul said, I know a man once, he had a heavenly vision of paradise, God's paradise, in the third heaven. Well, now, if there is a third heaven, it logically stands that there is a first and second heaven. And and in Revelation, it speaks of the mid-heavens. So, Satan's headquarters in Daniel 9, you remember that the Michael, that the archangel Michael was had to fight with the prince of Persia to get through the mid-heavens to bring a message to Daniel. It took three weeks. That is where Satan's headquarters is today. And that war is still going on. And you are called to warfare. Now, you can either be a soldier of Jesus Christ or you can be a prisoner of war, captive of the devil. Now, Remember that we said in Luke 4 that the commission of Jesus Christ, that he, gave, he spoke at Luke 4.18. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and preach deliverance to the captives. Now, that word captive there literally means prisoner of war. If you look it up in Strong's Concordance, it'll say prisoner of war. If you break it down into Greek, it is a captive taken at the point of the spear. You were captives and you were prisoners of war. Of the war, you were captured when Adam fell. And you inherited from him. You were a child of wrath and inherited a rebellious nature from him. That was spoken of in Ephesians. Let's look at Ephesians 3. Actually, it's Ephesians 2, 3, I'm sorry. And it said, starting with verse 1, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according 
to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature or by birth children of wrath. Now, Galatians 2.15, that word is used there, and Paul says to Peter, we were by nature Hebrews, not heathen sinners, meaning that we were born, they were born Hebrew. And this same word, we, you were born by birth, children of wrath. Jesus, Adam was called the first man. Jesus became the second or the last man. Jesus was the last Adam and the second man. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus sealed off the entire Adamic nature. 1 Corinthians 15:45. And so it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the earth, made from dust. The second man, Jesus, is the Lord from heaven. Jesus is called Ben Adam, a son of Adam, 80 times in the Gospels. And in the genealogy in Luke, he carries himself back. He is carried back to being a son of Adam. Now, he became the divinely appointed representative of the human race. Let's look at Hebrews 2, 10 to 18. For it was fitting for him, of whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many children to glory, many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctified and those who are being sanctified are all are one, and for this reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus became your Redeemer kinsman. Jesus came, laid aside his humanity, the second person of the Godhead, the Son, came, laid aside his divine privileges, took on humanity, walked out his life, and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He became our representative to bear our iniquities and our transgressions. Now, it says in verse 16 of Hebrews 2, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but gives aid to the seed of Abraham. Now, the only way that anybody in this room has any claim on the covenant promises of Jesus Christ and Abraham is that you are adopted into the family of God, that Jesus Christ adopted you as children, sons of God. He became your big brother. Under the principle of the Hebrew law, if you ran your business so poorly that you lost everything that you owned and were sold into slavery, as Adam was, and his children after him, any children that a man had after he became a slave stayed slaves, stayed captives. And you ran your business so poor that if you had a near kinsman under the principle of a goal, he was obligated to redeem you. Now, this is played out in the story of Ruth and Boaz. All of you are familiar with this story. Boaz was the redeemer kinsman who redeemed Ruth. Now, there was another law that required him to marry her that I won't go into to raise up seed for his deceased brother, his deceased royalty, near royalty. But he was, he was the Redeemer kinsman. Jesus Christ is your Redeemer kinsman. He has redeemed you. He is your deliverer. He has delivered you from bondage. And he has adopted you so that you are sons of God and join heirs with him. Now, to do this, he had to pay the price. And the price was his blood. For it's impossible for the, for the blood of goats and bulls. It's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to put away sin. And without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption from sin. Jesus had to shed his blood. 
He was the Lamb of God. It says in Second Peter, He was a Lamb without blemish. And he redeemed us, not with a corruptible gold or silver, but the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, a Lamb without blemish. He was called by John in, first, in the first chapter of John as the Lamb of God. Paul says, Jesus, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Now, I could spend the next hour and a half just talking about what I'm just sort of skimming across because there's so much there. But I want to get to where I'm going. I want to talk to you about the exchanges that Jesus made on the cross. What he took upon himself that you might have. What he took upon himself. What he gave up and took upon himself that you might have. So you'll know who you are what your rights are, and what your inheritance is as a child of God. Let's look at Isaiah 53, 6. We may vary a little bit from that, but you need to put your marker there because we will be back there a whole lot. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. First verse is um, 6 says, 5 says, and 6 says, On Him the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all. The iniquity. Now that's evil, that is rebellion and all its evil consequences. He laid that on Jesus. So he exchanged for him our rebellion and its evil consequences and received his righteousness. And let's look back at verse 5. First exchange. Jesus he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Wounded, there means pierced, for our transgressions. Now, a transgression is a breaking of the law. If you violate God's law and you don't know it, that's a sin. It's still a sin. But if you violate the law and know it, that is a transgression. And so he was pierced or wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised or crushed for our iniquities. That's for our evil rebellion. That's when we know it's wrong and we shake our hand and fist in God's face and say, we're going to do it anyway. The chastisement, the punishment of, the, of our peace was placed upon him. Our peace. That word there, shalom, it means more than peace. It means health, and wholeness, and prosperity, and goodness. It is, a, it is a Hebrew's greeting today. Paul joined the Hebrew greeting and the Roman greeting, greeting. And he said, grace, which is unmerited favor, and shalom to you. The Romans said, char, char, and charis, charis to you, which is grace, unmerited favor, from which we get our word charismatic, in which we get charismatic gifts or the charisma. All come from the root of grace, a free gift, a free gift. Now let's look at John 20. Keep your finger in Isaiah, and let's go over and look at John 20. John 20, verses 19, 21, and 26. In the same day, speaking of the resurrection, the first appearance of Jesus Christ, he said, Peace be to you. In 20, 19, he said, Peace be to you. 21, he again said, Peace to you. And then, 26, when he came again, he said, Peace. Okay, now let's look at Luke 24, 36. So Jesus greeted his disciples with peace. And here in Luke it says, it says Jesus greeted them with the peace again. And he says in John 16, I think, I thought I had written it down, but I don't see it. He said, My peace I give to you, and I have come that you might have peace. And so the first exchange was Jesus took our judgment for our iniquities and transgressions and rebellious acts and the chastisement of our peace, our shalom. 
He took that for us, that He might give us reconciliation with God, right standing, righteousness, right standing before God, and peace. Going back to Isaiah 53 now, the second one he said, Surely he's borne our grief and sickness and carried our pain, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, if you'll turn over to Matthew 8, 18, you'll see that Matthew translates this, 17, I'm sorry, Matthew 8, 17, that it might be full, it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Almost all the translations in Europe, in Germany, Martin Luther translated grief, sickness, and sorrow, pain, smell, pain. And in the King James the King James translators could not believe. They just couldn't. They couldn't comprehend that Jesus had borne our illnesses. Although, when they got to the King, when they got to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit translated it differently, and the word used in the Greek can't be translated any other way. And by His stripes we are healed. That is past tense. And if you look at First Peter, two twenty-four. It says, by his stripes you were healed. It's an accomplished fact that Jesus has borne all of your infirmities and all of your sickness, and you have been healed by his stripes. You're healed. You're healed. And you have to walk that out. Sister Coffee gave an example of walking it out for three months. Four months, and everybody kept calling her a liar. Said, "Now, Sister Coffee, you know that you are healed. You're still in pain." Good, Job's comforters. <laughs> and she said, "The Word of God says, I am healed. I was healed by the stripes of Jesus. It's an accomplished fact, and I'm accepting that, and I will not accept this pain." And you need to tell your flesh, line up with the Word of God. Line up with the Word of God. Now, healed used the word healed in the King in uh, Peter is therapeuti. It's from the modern word that we get therapeutics. And it was a word that originally was meant a servant girl waiting on you. And it gradually grew to be to be healed, to be nursed back to help. It does not mean an instantaneous cure. It means being nursed back to health over a period of time. Now there's a number of words in the Bible for healing. I did a study once on healing, and I don't want to go into that tonight. That takes about six hours. But there are a number of words that are translated healing. And the most common one is therapeutic. The next most, common one, next most common one is the word which we translate salvation. But by his stripes you are healed. By his stripes. And so he took your sickness, took all your pain and sickness, that you might receive healing. People ask me how I feel about it. I say I don't think there's any healing outside of Jesus Christ. Now, he can heal any way he wants to. But I don't want to go into that today. I will get down that rabbit trail, and I won't get off for an hour. Okay. Let's look at the third exchange. Let's look at Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him or crush him and put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, make his soul an offering for sin. Now, you notice that it's sin singular, not sin sins, it's sin. Now, there he is talking about the body of sin, the law of sin and death, the body of sin, the sin principle in your nature, that sin principle in the rebellious nature of Adam that makes you a slave to sin. 
Now let's hold our fingers in Isaiah and turn over to Romans 6. Romans 6, 6, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, or rendered inoperative, that we're no longer slaves of sin. No longer slaves. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.31. 5.21. There's no 31. For he, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. Now, the first charismatic gift listed in the New Testament, charisma gift listed, grace gift, is righteousness. The gift of righteousness. That was an exchange made on the cross. And Jesus Christ is our righteousness, our right standing before God. He took our sinful acts, our sin, our guilt, our sin nature that manufactures sin and gave us His perfect righteousness. It is said by a number of Bible commentators that is when Jesus hung on the cross and our sinful nature was laid upon him, he cried out, Why have you forsaken me? He cried out to the Father and said, Why have you forsaken me? For the first time, he had always been in perfect communication with the Father. He never said anything. Said He said in John that he tells me what to say and how to say it. But suddenly he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because our sinful nature was placed upon him as a scapegoat to carry it into the wilderness. He became our scapegoat. You know, are you familiar with the principle of the scapegoat? What, what happened with the scapegoat? Now, you know what a term of scapegoat is. On the Day of Atonement, the tenth day, the Day of Atonement, the high priest, they brought to him after he had sacrificed a bull for his own sin and gone and atoned for his own sin. He came back to the door of the tabernacle and they brought him two goats. And he cast lots. And one was a sin offering and the other was the Lord's goat. And he placed his hands on the Lord's goat. The sin offering was, was killed. The blood was captured. He was burned outside the camp. And the blood was taken in and spread on the, tar on, on the mercy seat, sprinkled over the mercy seat. And then he placed his hands on the head of the scapegoat and transferred all the sins of Israel. And then that goat was taken by the hands of a fit man out into the middle of the desert and turned loose to die. And he bore, carried away, all the sins of the people for that year. Jesus carried away our sins. He bore them away. He was our scapegoat. We received His righteousness. He Himself is our righteousness. Okay? And you go, let's go back over here, back to Isaiah 53 again. 10. It said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him or to crush him. He has put him to grief. Now, that word grief means sickness. It's the same word that we saw down in 4. He said, He had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And God put him to sickness. Let's look at Micah 6.13. And you'll notice here it says, Therefore I will make you sick by striking you. That word sick there is the same word translated grief in Isaiah. 1 John 3.5 He was manifested. We know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. And eight, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, He might destroy the works of the devil. And so that exchange is that He took away sickness. Let's look at Exodus chapter 15, 26. Keeping your hand in Isaiah, let's go over to Exodus now. You're all familiar with this passage. It says, If you will diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God that's right in His ears and His commandments and keep His statutes, I will put none of the diseases 
on you which are born of the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who healeth thee. I am Jehovah Rapha. Okay. Now, if we go to Exodus 23, 25, it says, You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness from the midst of you. Now, there the promise is more than healing, and you won't get sick. You won't get sick. And if you companion verse to that is Deuteronomy 7.15, where he says that I will take sickness from you. Now, those are the first four exchanges. Number five says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let's look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's in Deuteronomy 21, 23. That the blessings of Abraham might come among the, upon the, the heathen in Christ Jesus, that they might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And he redeemed us from the curse of the law. And people will tell you that I am under, not under the law, I am under grace. How many people say that we're living in grace? I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And that is true. Let's look back at Romans 10.4. It says, Christ is of the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It means, that. what does that mean? That means that you can't get your right standing before God by keeping the law. But what does Matthew 5 say? What does Jesus say about that? Jesus says, 5.17, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or tittle will by no means pass the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so, you see, the, the, the commandments or the statutes have not passed away. They still sin. And they have a just penalty for sin. And the penalty is a curse. The penalty is a curse. But praise God, Jesus Christ took the curse. Took it. Took the curse upon himself that we might have the blessing. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 11, I think it is. Yes, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. Moses said, Behold, I set before you a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and a curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way I command you to go after other gods which you have not known. Now, you're all children of Abraham. You're all seed of Abraham. And these commandments were placed into effect for the seed of Abraham. And they were spoken into effect and agreed to by your ancestors. And they carried a curse and a penalty. But Jesus took the curse that you might have the blessing. Now, the, the, re, the release from the curse is not automatic. Some people say, will tell you, and I hope I don't step on anybody's doctrinal toes, and if, I, if you disagree with me, I love you. And I won't get mad with you if you don't believe everything just the way I do. If you go, we won't get mad with me because I don't believe everything just the way you do. I won't get mad with you. I mean, we can. I, I think it's terrible to, to the, the schisms in the body of Christ over minor doctrinal points. Over doctrinal points. The most important thing is that Jesus Christ died for us and that we're saved by grace as a free gift. And that demons are alive, praise you, Jesus. And that Christ is alive, that we serve a living God. But He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
if the curse breaking would be automatic with salvation, then your healing would be automatic with salvation. If the curse would be breaking would be automatic, then your salvation would be automatic. Because it says in, in, in John 3.16 that Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He came to save the world, not to condemn it. But you have to believe on His name. And you have to accept Him as your Redeemer kinsman. Ruth could have rejected Boaz, but she did not. She went to him and she slept under and she allowed her, she allowed him to pull his robe over her. You know how important that is? That robe represents Jesus is clothed in the robe of righteousness. And when Boaz pulled the corner of his garment over Ruth, that was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ pulling the robe of righteousness over you and covering and taking your sin and covering you and giving you right standing before God as you stand in His righteousness. Now, but you have to accept that. Just then you must claim, claim release from the curses of your ancestors. Where does it say in the Bible that we must ask to pray for the sins of our ancestors? Now let's look at Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26.40. Here God is saying what He will do when they come back to Him, when they've sinned and they come back. But if they will confess the, their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness, and this term fathers means ancestors, in their unfaithfulness in which they have been unfaithful to me, they will also walk contrary to me. There you see you must confess the iniquity of your ancestors and ask that the curse be broken. It's Leviticus 26:40. Now, 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light and have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, that is in the continuing tense in the Greek. And you can say, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, if we stay in the light, in the Spirit, and have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ continually, we continually walk in the light as He's in the light, and continually have fellowship one with another. Then the blood of Jesus Christ will continually cleanse you of all sin, people. You know, if you could walk in the Spirit, you'd never be sick. If you could walk in the Spirit 100% of the time, you'd never be sick. Never be sick. The devil couldn't touch you. If you could walk under a divine umbrella, all the time. And I think there's going to come a time that you can. Well, why else would he say, be holy as I am holy? Be pure. He says, only the pure in heart will see God. Pure comes from the same root. It's an adjective of holy. Only the pure in heart will see God. Without holiness, it is impossible to see God. The curses are listed in Deuteronomy 28, and so are the blessings. We will glance at them briefly. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28. These are the curses that breaks off of you. A com not a complete list. There's a book back there by Steve Bell called Breaking Free that lists a hundred and some odd curses. And it says the blessings, though, start at verse 1 and go through verse 14. And he says... Uh, and all these blessings shall come upon you, starting in verse 2, and overtake you because you obey, obey the voice of the Lord your God. And he goes on and blesses you from one end to the other. And he says, you know, that if you just do this, you won't have to look for them. They're going to run down the road and overtake you. But now we look at the verse 15. shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God and carefully observe all of his statutes, his commandments and statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And he curses you everywhere and says, and I once made a list of all the diseases listed there, and it covers every disease system. It's a complete list of diseases. And then it says all the others not listed. It covers it. And so... But Christ redeemed us from the curse. And if we confess our sin, He 
is faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Break the curse. I see young ladies, young men, who molested his children, and their parents were molested his children, and their grandparents were molested his children, and this thing just goes down to the family. It's just a curse. It just goes down to the family line. And when I break this curse, we go through it, we break it, God almost always reassures that person that the curse has stopped him. He will go no further. Because one of the overriding fears of those people is that it's going to happen to their children, to their grandchildren, and they have tried to stop it, and it won't stop. But you, Jesus was made a curse so you can break the curse of the legal right from that evil spirit to be manifested in that family. Praise you, Lord Jesus. I don't want to get into that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying very hard to stay on my subject matter so we can... Not be here until 10.30. Okay. Number six. Jesus bore our poverty that we might be rich with his wealth. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8.9. 2 Corinthians 8.9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus redeemed you from the curse of poverty that you might be rich. You might be prosperous. Now, what does prosperous mean? Biblical prosperity. I tell the people in where I live that I minister to, the prosperous section of town is in the east and it's up on a hill. And when you become socially prominent and successful business, you expected to buy a house up on the hill. And that is a sign that you got it made, that you have reached financial success mark in the world. And I tell them that God's prosperity does not mean a house on the hill and a new Cadillac in your garage. Doesn't mean that. I can tell you that greed's mouth is never full, people. The Bible says greed's mouth is never full. It's like the greed that cries more, more. I served the God Manum for 20 years. Made a fantastic amount of money. I never had God's peace. I never had help. I, uh, if you told me I was prosperous, I would say you were mistaken. I need to make more money to pay my bills. And I, my answer to my problem was always to make more money. And that was not the answer to my problems. I found Jesus Christ and He showed me that was not the answer to my problems. After He... It took a while for it to get through my thick head, though. Now... He bore our poverty that we might have His riches. You know, this is given through one channel, grace. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't earn it. You can't give your way into prosperity. I think that God honors you when you give. I think that it is necessary to tithe. As a brother said, tithing is the stick that holds the windows of heaven open for you to Throw your offerings out. And we've talked about the curse in Malachi on people that don't tithe. And we've talked about the curse in Haggai on people who don't give offerings. And the curse is of poverty. And Jesus came and set you free from all that. But you have to tithe. It's God's economy. You go participate in God's economy. When I have people come and ask me to pray for their finances, the first thing I ask them is, do you tithe? And answer frequently is, I can't afford to. And I said, you can't afford not to. And then I say to them, if you wish to steal from God and contend with Him for your finances, that's your business. But please do not involve me in it. Don't involve me in fighting God for your finances when you're stealing from Him. And they say, does that mean you're not going to pray for me? I said, you got it. I will counsel you to start tithing. 
Well, I can't afford it. can't afford not to. You need to tithe. The tithe says, trust me in this. But now you cannot tithe. It's a rare person, when he's saved, that can tithe and continue his lifestyle. Because most people live right up, right up there, right at the top. And you say, take 10% off, well, what am I going to give up? Am I up, give up something? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're going to give up something. You're going to change the way you live. If you're not willing to change the way you live, then you won't be able to tithe. But Christianity, to become a Christian, requires you to change the way you live. Now, God can, uh, he can stir up your circumstances around you where you can change. He will change whether you like it or not. He'll stir up that nest for you a little bit. I'll always remember the great preacher, Smith Wigglesworth, getting a little off on the side. A lady came to Smith Wigglesworth once in the prayer line and said, Brother Wigglesworth, I need to learn patience. Would you pray that God will give me patience? And so Brother Wigglesworth laid his hands on her head and said, Lord, bring tribulation into the life of this sister. And she said, no, no, Brother Wigglesworth, I didn't ask for I asked for patience. He says, Scripture says, tribulation bringeth patience. Bring tribulation into the life of the sister, Lord. And he went on to the next one. I told that at my prayer group once, and there was this man on the end of the table. He slapped his Bible shut. He said, I ain't going to ever pray for patience again as long as I live. <laughs> and so... God can stir up your finances. But He promises you biblical prosperity. Now, biblical prosperity is to have enough. Paul said if you got clothes on your back, food in your stomach, and a place to sleep, what more do you want? And God says, biblical prosperity, as I understand it, is enough money to meet your needs, not your wants, the needs, and to have some left over to share with others. Pay your tithe and give offerings. That's biblical prosperity. Now, God will prosper you that you can do this in the station that He has called you to in this life. That ministry, that place that He has for you, that He's called for you, He will provide that you can have adequate provision in that life. And that you look upon, look to Him, and He will supply. You pray like it all depends on you. and you, I mean, you pray like it all depends on God, and you work like it all depends on you. You know, the Bible says those don't work when we eat. Now, there is one channel, there's one basis, it's given through grace. There's one channel, Jesus Christ. There's one administrator, the Holy Spirit, and there's one basis. I mean, there's one way to appropriate through faith. All of God's promises, one channel. They have grace gifts given through Jesus Christ on the basis of the atoning work at the cross, administrated by the Holy Spirit, and appropriated through faith. All of these gifts. And Second Corinthians eight, I mean nine, seven to eight, let's look at that. Oh we him. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, having all sufficiency in all things and abundance in every good work. Okay, he's talking about giving. Now, the last exchange made at the cross. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with or rendered inoperative, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Our old man is the rebellious nature received from Adam. It's called the body of sin in Romans 8.10. It's called the body, the body of sin, the body of the sins of the flesh, and the flesh. Paul used all these terms pretty much interchangeably. And he said that that had been crucified with Jesus Christ. He died. Now, let's look at Ephesians 4.20. Ephesians 4.20. And here Paul says, But you have not learned so in Christ. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. 
The flesh is deceitful, people. It will lie to you and seduce you. It will get you to compromise. It will get you to compromise the Word of God, to compromise your testimony, to compromise your stand, and suck you back in. Let's look at Jeremiah 17, 9. Keep your finger in Romans, in Ephesians. Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How the Lord search the heart and test the mind. I love the Jeremiah 17 because it contains a cursing and a blessing that I love to read. Cursed, verse 5. Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see the good when it comes, but inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and the salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes, but a leaf will be green, will not be anxious in the year of draw, nor cease from yielding fruit. That was written... 25, 2,700 years ago, and it's still true today. It's as true today as it was then. You put your trust in man and not in God, and you will live to, to woe the day. The old man is a corrupt tree, deceitful, corrupt tree. Now, in Matthew 10, John the Baptist said the axe is going to be laid to the root of that tree. He says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. And let's look at the companion verse now. Matthew 7, on the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. 7.17 Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, nor a bad tree bear fruit. But every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You'll notice that they don't try to reform the old man. They don't send him to Sunday school. They don't send him to a counselor. They try to make him re-educate him. They execute him. He's executed. He's executed on the cross. And you have to put him off and walk in the Spirit. Put him all walk in the Spirit, or he will corrupt you. Now, you put on the new man, back in Ephesians 4, 24. It says, and you put on the new man, which is created according to God, in righteousness and true holiness. If we go over to Colossians 1, 20, we'll see what the Bible says the new man is. To them, God will to make known for the riches of the glory of the mystery of the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Galatians 2.20 said, I am crucified with Christ. It's not I that live, but Christ in me. 1 Corinthians, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Of Him, the Father, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You are placed in Jesus Christ. Your new man is Christ Jesus in you. The new nature is created. So let's look at 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again. Let's start with verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brother, and love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Okay. And so you have a new nature in you that's born from God's incorruptible seed. Now let's look at 1 John 3, 9. It says, Whoever is born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, I hope you realize that there... He's talking about that new nature that is born in you. Well, if I had to say that since I'm, I know that I'm born again, but I'll have to say that uh, I have sinned since I was born again. But that new nature in me does not sin. You have two natures in you then. 
Let's look at 1 John 5, verses 4. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is our victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And 18 says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he has been... But he who is born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. People, you have two natures in you. You have the nature, that sin nature, that you crucified. The old man was crucified. But the body of sin, that sin nature, is no longer a slave to it, but still there. 1 John uh, 4, 1 John 15, uh, 5, 4, verse 4 and 18, I'm sorry. You have two natures in you. You have that sin nature, which has been rendered inoperative, as long as you don't yield to it. And you have a new nature, Christ in you. Now, which nature is going to rule your life depends on which one you feed the most. An eagle normally has one egg, but sometimes she'll lay two eggs, and both eggs will generally hatch. And the eagle mother will come back and she will feed, and she will feed the first mouth that gets up there. And the one that begins to get fed the most will get bigger and stronger than the other one, and he will push him out of the way and take all the food. And then this other one will get weak, and you will see him sitting on this other eagle's head, eating all the food. And before long, this other eagle is dead and pushed out of the nest, and you only have one eagle, one chick. Now, you've got two natures in you, people. And the one that's going to survive and grow and thrive is the one that you feed the most. What are you feeding it? Are you sitting before the boob tube and taking in the pornography and the X-rated shows and Showtime and HBO and Cinemac and whatever else they have on that thing? Are you watching the jigglers walk across there? Thinking about it? I mean, what are you watching? Are you going out to the racetrack, to the horse track? Are you going to the bar? I mean, what are you feeding it? Are you reading the Word of God? Are you fellowshipping with Christians? Are you going to church and getting fed regularly? And if you think that you can go to church and hear a one hour sermon once a week, and that's going to fill your spirit, man, your new nature. Christ in you. He won't. It needs a regular infusion once, twice a day. David said, Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, people, you want to stay free, feed your spirit man. Feed him. Feed him the word of God. Put a guard on your mouth. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Only what gives edification. Let all rage and anger and hostility and bitterness, malice depart from you. Clamor and loud shouting, loud arguing. But be ye kind one to another, forgiving as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Just don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What grieves the Holy Spirit of God? Rebellion grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Clamoring, loud, accusing, unforgiveness shuts you off from God. That's what shuts you off from God. Spiritual things are done on a 24-hour basis. If you repent, repent quickly. If you sin, repent quickly. And don't let the sun go down on it. Because a new day begins. Hebrew days began with sundown. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your sin without making it right. Scripture says if, you've got, if you come to the altar with a gift and you've got anything in your heart against your brother, put your gift down and go get right with your brother first. Get right standing with him. Then come back and God will accept you. These are the exchanges made. These are the things that you can claim. That Jesus took your judgment for your sinful rebellion that you might have peace and reconciliation. He took your sickness and sorrow, pain, that you might be healed. He took your sin 
that you might be made the righteousness of God. He was put to sickness that you might be, have perfect health. He redeemed you from the curse that you might have the blessings due Him. He bore your poverty. When did He bear your poverty? On the cross. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28. In verse 47, 28, 47, it says, You did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of gratitude of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and need of all things. That's poverty, people. I mean, that's poverty. Hungry, thirsty, naked, and in need of all things. Jesus bore that on the cross. He had not eaten for 24 hours. One of the last things on the cross was, I thirst. He was naked. He had no clothes on. He was stripped naked and nailed up and exhibited to the public. Now, the shame of being held up naked was part of the humiliation of crucifixion. He lacked all things. He had nothing. He bore that curse of poverty on the cross. It's do us that we might have His riches. The riches. What kind of riches did He have? He had a credit card on God's bank account. That's what He had. He had the credit card on God's bank account. And you got that when you walk in the Spirit. God will provide for you your needs. Not your wants, but your needs. As long as you walk perfectly with Him, you'll never have a want. And if you mess up and you repent and turn from it, God will forgive you and provide and provide. And you know, you don't have to sit there and bemoan it for three months. If you truly repent, turn, and claim it, God will put it in the sea of forgetfulness. And you don't have to go back again. He'll throw it behind his back. He says, your sins and transgressions I will remember no more. A friend of mine called me. and He uh, had uh, led a rather worldly life. And he was living with his sixth wife. And he got saved. He and his wife got saved together at Camp Father Out from one of the camp further out in North Carolina. And they had been saved and walking with God for about five years. And he called me one day and he said that, this, that he had been unfaithful to his wife before they got saved. And he had confessed his sin before God, but he had felt that the Holy Spirit had witnessed it, that he should confess it to his wife. And he was afraid it would hurt her very badly. And he could see no point in that, but he was still carrying us around. And I said to him, Have you gone before God and broken the curse over this and confessed it to God and turned from it? He said, Five years ago. I said, well, Five years ago, God forgot about it. And he will not bring it up to you five years later and tell you that you're supposed to go confess it to your wife now at this later. He won't do that. I said, You are not. That is a. That's the enemy is trying to deceive you and disrupt the harmony in your home. God forgets. Once you've covered it with the blood, God forgets. You don't have to carry that burden anymore. And He gave you a new nature. Your old, corrupt, deceitful nature was crucified with Jesus Christ. And you received Christ, a incorruptible seed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, what does that mean when the devil attacks you. First, you are a child of God. Let's look at Romans 15. 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You've been adopted. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, as of God, and join as with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, we may be glorified with Him together. It makes you a child of God. Okay? 
Now let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5.30. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let's look at Colossians 2.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us in the kingdom of the Son of His love. And Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly await for the Savior of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. People, do you understand what those scriptures mean? It means that you are no longer a son of Adam. You are a son of God. You are no longer... In this world system, you have been translated out of this world system into the kingdom of His love. You are no longer a citizen of this world, but you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And you are an ambassador for God. Do you understand what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a personal representative of the king. You're a personal representative of the king. If somebody threatens one of our ambassadors, the full force and power of the United States Marines and Army and Navy is brought to bear to back up that ambassador. You are the ambassador for Christ. The full power and authority of the kingdom of God is at your disposal. And if the devil bothers you, Greater is he who is in you, who is in the world. That is your authority. And you need to stand on it. And you don't say, please, Miss Devil, will you please go away? And that's what the witch doctor says. That's what the witch doctor talks to the demons. He says, please, little friend, will you move over and let this good demon come in? And you bad demon, you move out of the way because you're hurting him. And he's paid me money. Little brother, will you please move? That's what the witch doctor says. And sometimes the witch doctor will take him into himself. And the next sucker who comes in, bad demon for him, may be a good one for this one. Yeah, he's got something for you. But you don't have to do that. That's what a spiritualist exorcist does. A spiritualist who's an exorcist will take demons into his body and then give them to somebody else. A Christian science practitioner, which is neither Christian nor scientific, it's pure spiritualism. Bad demon for him. Bad spirit for him. They don't call them demons. Bad spirit for him. Maybe good spirit for you. Trade the devil's counter, and I'll tell you one thing. You always trade up. You don't ever trade down. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to say, please, Mr. Devil. You say, Devil, I stand at the foot of the throne of God. I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I command you by the authority vested in me, in, in me, I come bind you and I command you to be gone. That is your authority. That is your authority. Now, God will probably will, will, will give you just as much authority as He can trust you with. And as you exercise it, as you walk in the Spirit, the more you walk in the Spirit, the more authority He'll give you. And keep your life free from sin. People... You need to know who you are in Jesus Christ. And the enemy cannot stand against you. I think that uh, we've all been sitting about two hours now. I think we all ought to stand up and praise God a bit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's just praise Him some. Praise and bless and glorify you, Lord God. Praise and bless and glorify you, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Lord, we praise you and we bless you and we glorify you, Lord, and we give thanks to you, Lord, for your great glory. Glory to you, Lord God. Oh, God, we praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. We just thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you all all sit down now? Fifteen years ago, when God called me to teach, He told me that I don't want you just to give religious lectures. I don't ever want you to have a meeting that you don't give people a chance to be set free. And so, I'm going to uh, lead you in a, in a confession for deliverance. And we're going to come against 
the powers and principalities, powers and principalities of the occult, of spiritual bondage. Say, dear Lord, dear Lord, I love you. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sin, that you were raised on the third day for my justification. Lord Jesus, you are my Redeemer, my Redeemer kinsman, my Lord and Deliverer, my, Lord and Deliverer. my, healer. my healer, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I, love you. I love you. Lord Jesus, I confess, Lord Jesus, I confess. The, sins of my the sins of my ancestors. I ask, Lord, I ask, Lord that you break me free, you break me free. From, any from any curses spoken, on, spoken over me. From any source, from any, from any curses that have come down through the family line because of disobedience of my ancestors. Lord Jesus, I break any curses spoken over me or my children in the name of Jesus. From any source, from any four false religion, from any cult that denies the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, that denies the divinity of Jesus Christ. I break all these covenants. I break all oaths. All promises made by me or my ancestors to any organization, any fraternity, any sorority, any lodge, any brotherhood of a satanic origin. Specifically, I break the curse of the Masons, the Eastern Star, the Mormon Church, Jehovah's Witnesses, or any other cult, in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I reject any familiar spirits that have come down through my family line as a result of the above. I reject any anointing or any mantle that has come down as a result of this disobedience or any disobedience to your word. I reject them in the name of Jesus. I bind them. I loose them from the house they assignment on my family. I command that they leave and be gone in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I forgive anyone who's ever hurt me, abused me, stolen from me, dominated me in any fashion contrary to the will of God. I forgive them. I forgive everyone who's ever hurt me in the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless them, Lord, and bring them salvation in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I forgive myself in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I break the curse of illegitimacy, the curse of incest, the curse of the vagabond, the curse of idolatry, the curse of whoredom, and any other curse on my family line. In the name of Jesus, I command all occult spirits 
All meditation spirits, All meditation spirits. Believe, me. believe me in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now leave them in the name of Jesus. All rejection spirits, all meditation spirits, all occult spirits, all Mormon spirits, all Jehovah's Witness spirits, all you spirits, I just bind you and command you to leave God's people in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all of you. I bind all Indian spirits and command them to leave. All harassing Indian spirits. I break all witchcraft curses that have been spoken over these people in the name of Jesus Christ. I break all ungodly soul ties to any person that's ever dominated or controlled them in any way contrary to the will of God. I break all these ties in the name of Jesus. And I command all these things to leave in the name of Jesus. I break all ties in the name of Jesus Christ. All soul ties in the name of Jesus. And I command them to go in the name of Jesus Christ. Go in the name of Jesus. Every one of you, go, go, go. Be gone in the name of Jesus. I break these ties in the name of Jesus Christ. I break all soul ties. I break any curses that have ever been spoken over them. Any prophecies have ever been spoken in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare them to no effect in the name of Jesus Christ. And I command you to go and release them in the name of Jesus Christ. I break any spirits in, them in the name of Jesus. I say, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Be gone. I break all spirits. I break all witchcraft spirits, all infirmity spirits in the name of Jesus. Be gone. Be gone. I speak to the spirit of another Jesus. I bind the spirit of another Jesus. And I say, be gone. The Jesus of Mormonism, the Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jesus of unity. I bind all of you, all you another Jesus spirits. And I command you to leave and be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Every one of you, go. Go in the name of Jesus. I bind you. I loose the hornets from heaven to drive you out in the name of Jesus. Come on. Turn God's people loose now. Turn them loose now. Turn them loose in the name of Jesus. Every one of you, be gone. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Every one of you, be gone. I break all spirits of necromancy in the name of Jesus Christ. All spirits of necromancy. All spirits of Mariology in the name of Jesus. I bind you and command you to turn God's people loose in the name of Jesus Christ. All spirits of Mariology. All spirits of necromancy. All Catholic spirits in the name of Jesus. All Episcopal spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. All Methodist and Baptist spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all religious demons in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind Osmodeus in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all Pharisee spirits in the name of Jesus. Be gone. All spirits of the Pharisee, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. All critical spirits, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. All spirits of criticism, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. All spirits of criticism and, e and ego vanity. Pride, ego, and vanity, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be gone. I bind all spirits of poverty in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind the poverty spirits in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all familiar spirits in the name of Jesus. I say, be gone. Be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Be gone. Be gone. Be gone in the name of Jesus. All of you, go, go, go in the name of Jesus. 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 Go. Go. I bind all spirits of Osmodeus in the name of Jesus. All necromancy spirits in the name of Jesus. Go, necromancy. Go. Go. Go, ancestor worship. Go, worshiping dead folks. Go. 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 Go, all spirits of the saints. I bind the saints in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all spirits of the saints in the name of dead saints. I bind them in the name of Jesus. Go. 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 All of you, go in the name of Jesus. Go on. Get out. Get out and be gone. Get out and be gone. Go. I bind every one of you. You can't stay around here anymore. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak healing, healing, healing in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I send the war angels out now to break all containers containing part of the soul in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Contains part of the soul in the name of Jesus. I send them, I send the ministering spirits out to gather up all soul now in the name of Jesus. All parts of the soul in the name of Jesus. I speak healing and restitution to God's people now in the name of Jesus. To their mind, to their will, and to their emotion in the name of Jesus. I speak healing to their mind, their will, and their emotions in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I speak healing now, Lord God. Restore what the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm have stolen, Lord. Lord, I speak healing now. 
In the name of Jesus. Everybody hold up their hands now. Let's stand up. Praise you, Jesus. I speak healing now, Lord. Lord, fill them with your Spirit, Lord. Fill them with your Spirit, Lord God. Fill them with the Spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and fear of the Lord. Fill them, Lord God, with your Spirit, Lord. Your Spirit of healing grace, Lord. Your Spirit of shalom and peace in the name of Jesus. Shalom. I speak shalom in the name of Jesus Christ. Peace. Peace. Peace I give you. He Himself is our peace. He is our peace. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I speak Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus. Emmanuel. God in us. In the name of Jesus. That name above all names. Thank you, Lord. Fill your people, Lord God. Fill them now, Lord. Fill them, Lord. I speak the beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. She might be a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Fill them full now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Praise and we bless and we glorify you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Touch your people now, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, you're so good to us, Lord God. You're so good to us, Lord. Now, Lord, I speak the blessings of Abraham upon him in the name of Jesus, Lord. I speak the blessings of Abraham in the name of Jesus Christ. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you and remain with you. May His face shine upon you. I did a good night's sleep tonight. Praise your Lord. And I'll see you all at 6 o'clock in the morning at prayer meeting. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.